Hello and welcome to Inside Intercom. I'm Liam Geraghty. On this week's show, I'm thrilled to welcome back Francis Brero, the co-founder and CPO of Mad Kudu, a marketing operations platform that helps companies identify, qualify and engage with their leads based on how likely they are to convert. The last time we spoke with Francis was in 2021, when he joined us to chat about how AI can boost your conversational support. The link to that episode is in the show notes. Recently, while at Sastock in Dublin, Ireland, I caught up with Francis to chat about personalizing your buyer journey. Francis gives four important learnings about product-led growth and manages to weave in a Lord of the Rings analogy. So bonus points for that. Francis, welcome back. You've been on the show before, but we're, we're glad to have you back. Yeah, good to be back. Thanks for having me. So just in case for anyone who kind of hasn't heard that first episode, could you give us a little kind of flavor of your career trajectory so far? Yeah, absolutely. So interesting, I guess, background. I started as an engineer. My academic background is in fundamental mathematics. Then I went into the dark side of sales. I was running all things revenue at Mad Kudu and switched back to run product. So a bit of a, a combination of all of that. So today, you know, I'd love to talk to you a little bit about like product led growth from like a blog post that you had done recently. And so you're obviously built a, you know, a leading product led growth platform for B2B companies. And so in doing that and partnering with PLG companies, can you tell me a little bit about the five stage methodology that you've developed, you know, in how to scale and monetize a product led growth? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at a high level, I'll say the biggest challenges that companies have when they start doing PLG is being a little bit too dogmatic about doing it one way or the other. And one of the big elements that we encourage most companies to think about is that you have different funnels when you're running a PLG business. So you're going to have people that come through inbound, they're going to raise their hand and you want to talk to them it's regular inbound process. You're going to have people that you know interact with content, like some great podcasts like this one, webinars, all that kind of goodness. There's people that are going to sign up for the product and there are people that you're going to reach out through outbound. And of course, there are people that are going to do all of the above, right? And so it's really critical that you start thinking about your go-to-market motions and how they align with the way people want to buy your software. And I think too often, PLG companies are going to be really, really deeply focused on this is how we want to sell and we want people to go into the product and like activate the product, get value from it, and then swipe the credit card. And unfortunately, that's not how everyone buys. They're going to, you know, look for education. In some places, we're also selling to B2B, right? So there's going to be people using the product. There's going to be people evaluating the product from outside the product. And, and really being able to understand what the typical customer journey is, is really critical to make sure that you align your go-to-market engine against that. Otherwise, Otherwise, it's, it's just, yeah, you're, you're forcing your view of how people should buy onto the customer. That's not an optimal experience. And in today's world, what we're seeing is that the companies that win are the companies that are doing the best job at making it easy for people to buy their software, just because software is getting easier and easier to create. So there's always going to be competition for whatever you do within a short period of time. And so competing and winning on go-to-market strategies, I think, is now becoming a pretty substantial differentiator. Is it something to be mindful of like from the get go, you know, or do you think like a lot of people might be in terms of their journey with their business, you know, might not be thinking about it, you know, from the start, but should they? Absolutely. I think from the start, you should embrace the fact that everyone has a different way of consuming your product or engaging with your product and therefore also procuring for your product. So you know, every company should have, you know, the ability for someone to request to talk to sales the same way that ideally you would want to have the ability to sign up for the product. So that, again, depends on if, if your product is easy to, you know, get into and get value from. You don't want to create an experience that's detrimental to the value. But I would say, yes, from the get-go, think about the fact that there's a multitude of people looking to buy software in a great variety of ways and build your go-to-market strategy to align with that. So I know for like a particular event, I think it was Mutiny's The Second Lever event, you gathered a group of 50 plus growth and marketing leaders for a discussion on how to leverage product data and, you know, to scale your revenue engines. And you came away with like four key learnings. I'd love to kind of like just go through them because I, 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 you know, read them on your blog recently and I think they're like super useful. So like the first one was product leg growth doesn't work in a vacuum. Yeah, and that's exactly what we just talked about. It's the fact that you can't think of 
product-led growth as a single funnel way of acquiring and growing customers. It is one go-to-market strategy that has a set of calls to action, but it lives within the context of people looking for education through webinars, through you know case studies, and potentially even talking to sales. It's like a very common thing that we see where someone from that company will engage in the product and then someone else is going to come and request a demo. So you have the difference between that kind of champion who's using the product and the you know, economic decision maker who potentially is going to be the one requesting a demo. And so really understanding that there's a broader context to product utilization than just the usage of the product is really critical to, to make sure you monetize it to the best of its capabilities. So the next one is self-data is garbage. Exclamation point. <laughs> Tell us about this. Yeah, that's another one that's really interesting where self-input data is essentially defined as when you know people sign up for your product, you're usually going to have a form where you ask for information like what is their job title, what kind of company size they're at, and all that kind of good stuff. And what we found through all of the studies across our customers is that that data is highly inaccurate. And there's actually a pretty interesting experiment that was run by Atlassian a couple of years ago where what they did is they had everyone who was signing up for uh, Jira would have to have like pick one of the values from a drop down menu. And what they found was that the distribution of values was very skewed towards the first value. And so what they did is they actually scrambled the order of the drop down values. And what they found is that no matter the order, the first value was always picked. And so what was interesting is that, you know, the cohort of signups week over week were pretty much the same in DNA, but the results in terms of what was being declared by users as their main job title would completely differ. And so what they found from that was that it's not very reliable to depend on that. And if you're depending on it a little bit too much, let's say that's going to drive your onboarding, you might actually create a suboptimal onboarding experience because you're too heavily relying on that information. So that's why it's a, a big thing to bear in mind that looking for third-party information about your users is generally going to be much more reliable and allow you to tailor the experience a lot better than trying to rely on first-party data. And I think too many companies over-index on, on that. Is that, I, I mean, like how quickly do you think that is happening? It seems like it's taken a while for us to kind of even get to this point. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those where it's, it's so easy to set up, you know, to ask for that data that Obviously, everyone wants to do it, and you kind of feel like people are going to be honest. And I think it's what's interesting is that it's a two sided problem. I think, on the one hand, I think it's terrible from a user experience. Like, the more fields you have in a form, the lower your fill rate and your conversion rate, right? So, you're actually you're just adding more friction to the experience by adding questions. And you're doing that in order to help you provide a relevant experience. But the problem is that the data you're acquiring is not reliable. So it's kind of this thing where it's, it, it feels comfortable because it feels like you're gathering more information that you're going to be able to provide to your sales team. So everyone feels good about it and wants to do it. But at the end of the day, unfortunately, it's just not that valuable. And it's, it's one of those things that tends to slow you down. And then people are going to ask for more data to compensate for some of the inaccuracies. And then you just like create more and more friction. And unfortunately, it leads to, you know, you go to some websites and you'll see like the sign up form is going to have like seven, eight, maybe even 10 fields to fill in. And, and by that time, I usually have given up already. Yeah, yeah exactly. I'm on to the next site. And then the third learning was product usage skews towards SMB. Yeah, that was, that's a really interesting one and something that we, we found a while ago and that was reshared by Thomas Tongus from Redpoint. One of the things that he found, and he mentioned that he had seen this at Google, is that when you look at product activity, usually what you're going to see is that the, the companies that are the most likely to adopt your free version of the product are going to be companies that are in a less regulated industry or a less regulated company, right? Because if you think about it this way, someone from Bank of America is much less likely to sign up for free on Intercom, put Intercom on the website and like start having chats with like Bank of America customers, right? And on the flip side, someone from, you know, a smaller company, even like a paddle or something like that, like they're very likely to be able to add Intercom on one of their landing pages and start getting responses and start adopting the product. And so what you start seeing is that if you only look for product usage to determine who you want to hand over to sales, you're never going to hand over Bank of America because they're never going to hit that threshold of usage. And, and that's why it's very dangerous to only rely on product usage data because it's really going to skew you towards the smaller side of the market. And that's a pretty common mistake that a lot of companies are going to make. 
And then the final one was, you know, selling enterprise deals at the lead level is impossible. <laughs> right. And this is where we go full circle with the first point we were talking about. When you're doing B2B sales, and especially in larger organizations, the, the deal desk is more than one person, right? There's going to be someone who's using the product. There's someone, potentially they're using the product to bring it for other people. Like Intercom is a great example, right? Like one person might be buying Intercom, but it's going to be deployed across the organization. It's actually going to be deployed across different teams. And so understanding the lay of the land of, who all these you know, different potential users and different stakeholders are in the deal is critical to determine, again, what your go-to-market strategy should be. And the challenge is very often we think in PLG very much about the user and we think about like who the trial user is, who the freemium user is, and, and all of that. And that works well in VSMB or SMB deals where one person can be the hero and like use the product, test it, adopt it, buy it, and then bring it to the rest of the company. But at larger companies and enterprises, you're usually going to have a lot of different people that you have to convince. And some of those are potentially going to try the product, but a lot of them are going to be like a CFO or procurement style person that might be reading content around like your security standards or like what are case studies from competitors or similar companies in the, in the space. And understanding that is really critical, again, to make sure that you align your go-to-market strategy with you know, the company that you're trying to sell to. One of the analogies that I use very frequently is, I think of the journey of selling in B2B as the story of the Lord of the Rings. So, the, the you know, the Lord of the Rings is a pretty simple story, right? It's like a fellowship that's, you know, com getting together to destroy a ring. And at the end of the day, sure, there's one person who's gonna carry it all the way into Mordor and destroy it, but all the other characters are actually like playing crucial roles in that story that help move the story forward. And what's even more interesting is that the instigator of all of this, Gandalf, is actually someone who's never really at the forefront of what's going on, right? He actually comes at the very end, like swoops in for the victory, and is also the person who starts everything. And this is like very, very common in B2B sales, where you're gonna have like the boss of someone who's like starting this initiative, and then they're gonna come in and be the person who signs the DocuSign at the very end, right? But you almost never see them in the deal, but they are in the background fighting enemies internally and like making sure that this project is gonna be prioritized, that we allocate budget and all that kind of good stuff. And then you have, you know, the Boromirs, the people that have a little bit of a competing interest in here and like they want to take this budget for themselves and for their own initiative and understanding and embracing that complexity of B2B sales is what helps companies succeed because when you acknowledge it and when you embrace it, then you can build a go-to-market strategy that aligns with the reality of businesses and it means that you're ready to confront the B2B sales process. Where does the rings of power come into this? <laughs> <laughs> the product you're here, I guess like displacing the competitor is the destruction of the ring of power. So lastly, is it just kind of a, a short catch up, I suppose, but what are kind of your, your own plans, you know, and the company's plans for, well, I suppose we're nearly at the end of the year now, but for the next few quarters, you know, any big plans or anything you're excited about? Yeah, we're, we're super excited about the growth plans. We've had some really awesome developments in the last few weeks. There's gonna be some public announcements that are gonna happen soon. And the, the main plan is really going to be accelerating our growth and just helping you know, product-led companies embrace the complexity of their sales cycles better and actually provide them with the tools to do that. So we're going to be expanding our engineering team in Paris. We're going to be expanding our go-to-market team. And that's, yeah, I mean, overall growing the company, which I'm really super excited about because we're hitting that kind of inflection point where we're now starting to accelerate a lot more and so yeah it's a different ball game it's like a different league that we're entering i see it as like okay like we won the championship of like whatever second division and now we're like looking to play champions league so it's like a different kind of like practice and training it's a different level of games also but i'm super excited about that and where can people find you online or follow you online I'm mainly active on LinkedIn, sometimes on, on Twitter, but Twitter is going to be more for like music and, and things like that that I share. But yeah, like LinkedIn is the, the best place to follow. 
And then for people who have listened to the previous episodes, something I have to ask is Nicolas Cage. And, and since it's been, I think it's been 2018 since we last had you on. So what I want to know now is, you know, I, you know have you updated your favorite Nicolas Cage movies, changed? Because he's done quite a lot of like interesting stuff in the last two years. Yeah, un unfortunately, very few of the movies he's made in the last few years <laughs> are contenders for the top spot. You know, it's the, the joys of just like shipping product <laughs> in mass. No, yeah, the, the order hasn't changed. I think okay. Vampire Kiss is still my my favorite. And, and yeah, I, I still, we still ask that question to any person joining a Mad Kudu of what's their favorite Nick Cage movie. We have a Notion document that ranks all the Nick Cage <laughs> movies. And I'm, yeah, I'm still very passionate about uh, the topic. I just love the fact that it's a very controversial topic that is not offensive to anyone, right? And it's, it's rare these days to be able to debate on something so vehemently without, you know, being, without ever hurting anyone's feelings. Yeah. Well, Francis, thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me again. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Francis Brero. If you did, I'd love you to give us a review on your podcast platform or social. It helps like-minded people find their way to our content. Okay, that's it. We'll be back next week with another great episode. See you then. This is Inside Intercom.